Greetings, everybody. I am Jewel Brousseau of Counter Esperanto Podcast. I'm Brian Kazaska from Twin Peaks Unwrapped, and you're hearing us on Geekonomics Podcast as well. And I am Josh Minton from the Red Room Podcast and from the In Our House Now Podcast. I'm really excited to talk to these guys because, for one thing, I don't have a lot of gamer friends to talk to about this stuff. This was kind of a watershed year for games for a number of reasons, but The Last of Us 2 came out late June. That was a game that a lot of us have been waiting for. Uh, it was announced, you know, several years ago, and then there was just like, except for a couple of clips now and then, it was just kind of radio silence. Then there was a couple of dramatic leaks several months ago <laughs> that kind of changed the narrative around the game, and then the game actually released, and it's been a hot topic ever since. So we're going to talk about a lot of that, but I think we should start with our history with the game, particularly the original game. So Brian, why don't you kick us off there? Uh, original game for me, I was late getting back into the Sony platform. I bought a PS3 on Black Friday. It's last year, 2012, right? And mm -hmm. Last of Us was going to come out in 2013 that summer. So I was playing all the Uncharted games. I was playing all the exclusives for Sony that I missed out on because I was on 360 at the time. And I was just like re-falling in love with Sony because I was a PlayStation 1 and 2 fan. But all my friends, we all jumped on 360 because we played online. My love for online died. I was just really in love with storytelling from that medium. And then when Last of Us came out, I was floored because I saw what Naughty Dog had done with Uncharted 1, 2, and 3. And I was like, these are summer blockbuster games. You go to a movie theater for a summer blockbuster, I could stay at home and have that same experience. But might be even a little bit better, I think. Um, and those games really redefined what a game would be, storytelling in gaming. And Last of Us came out and just kind of floored me just with the storytelling. I would always say it was like watching, at the time, an HBO limited series. I had nothing else to describe it to. It was like an HBO show. It was an emotional journey. The ending stuck with me. It was hard to talk to anybody because all of my friends hadn't played it because they were on 360. So I was just kind of like, no, man, you got to play it. I'm so happy that the three of us get to talk about this game because it's something I haven't had at all to talk to others about it. But that's where I was with the first game. But yeah, groundbreaking. I would say it was groundbreaking for the industry for gaming, definitely. Yeah, Josh, what about you? So very similar in journey path to what Brian just laid out. Now, I've always been a dual console owner. So I've always bought the Xbox and the whatever the latest version of the PlayStation and Xbox were. So I kind of cross played that, but not since Bioshock on the Xbox 360 had I experienced something that felt like playing a novel. To me, I think that's like the pinnacle of what these story type video games that Naughty Dog produces and Rockstar produces is that you're essentially playing inside of a novel and the choices you make actually you know impact the world around you for me i agree with you completely brian it was a completely immersive experience and i feel like last of us came out early enough in the walking dead phase where it hadn't quite been saturated yet and you felt like oh my god there are zombies everywhere um and it's also so unique of a story that the zombies or monsters that you fight are so secondary to what's happening inside the story that it was always going to be a fresh experience, even when you replay it. I'd say the zombies are infected in The Last of Us are almost more like uh, environmental hazards, you know, <laughs> than anything else. Great. Yeah. Yeah, great. For me, I had an Xbox. I had two generations of the Xbox and I had the 360. And then I was thinking about I realized that there were all these exclusives that I missed on the other side of things, you know, and so I decided to get a PS4 in 2014 as my graduation present for to myself for college. And I thought, oh, I'll have time now. And so um, it was the Naughty Dog games that I gravitated towards first. It was like 20 bucks or something to get The Last of Us Remaster. I had vaguely heard of it. It was one of those like, what was the other one? Quiet Rain or Soft Rain or something. Beyond Two Souls and then Heavy Rain. Heavy Rain, yeah. Heavy Rain was great, but The Last of Us was just something I'd never, I finished that and I thought, wow, this is not only one of the best video games I've ever played, but it was one of the best stories I've ever seen. The constant situation in that is that something would just floor me and I'd be crying and then like all of a sudden there'd be like something really intense that I have to handle so I'm taking my glasses off because I've sprayed tears on them and I'm like oh god what do I gotta do you know and so now you're having to shoot dudes you know that's something like I've never really experienced so there was kind of a lot going into The Last of Us 2 I know Josh on, on our House Now podcast you talked about baggage with Twin Peaks you know there's baggage here this is sort of a big game to live up to a lot of people thought oh this game doesn't need a sequel I think what they did is they just pulled off something 
unbelievable with this story. There's a lot of controversy around that, and we'll touch on that a little bit later, but and we, we want to talk about gameplay for starters, and then we'll get into the story. When you played the original The Last of Us and then picking this up, what are some of the similarities, and what do you think are some of the improvements that they made with gameplay? Last of Us is a, it's actually a really interesting game from a technical perspective. So if you think of like traditional fighting games, uh, like Destiny, for example, I'm a huge Destiny player. It's the game that I play the most. So mm-hmm. obviously fighting skill is very complex. you got to know a lot of different combinations of things. you got to have timing down. Last of Us is actually really simple in its technical mechanics of how you fight and interact with your environment. But within that simplicity, there's a lot of nuance So, for example, you may get into an engagement where you have to figure out how this person's attacking you from multiple angles and then form a strategy around working within that simplicity. And I feel like it requires a little bit more grace as a player. And so I think it's one of the few games that really started to make me focus on my small movements, you know, as opposed to just smashing buttons. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it's weird. The first game, the story outshined all its flaws. It was one of those games that came out and it had some flaws. There's a lot of uh, puzzles where Joel had to get Ellie to point A to point B because she didn't know how to swim. People were kind of aggravated by that. You know, I thought it was a cool little character thing. She doesn't know how to swim. Why, Why would she know how to swim? So he has to help her. There were times in Last of Us 1 where the colors would kind of stop you from figuring out where to go at some mm-hmm. places when you, everything looks kind of the same. Something they improved with this one. The gameplay, I, yeah, was immensely improved. Also, you can play totally stealth, which is kind of cool. You can go guns blazing. You might not make it, but stealth is the way to go. And I liked how that mechanic is just you're slowing down your breathing. You're trying to listen for movement. But yeah, gameplay, I think, vastly improved from the first to this one. I have no complaints about the gameplay in this one at all. I love it. You look back on the original and you're like, well, there's got to be something wrong with it. Well, the gameplay wasn't that good. I kind of feel like it's that sort of thing. Like the story just outshined those little tiny flaws. I guess when something's so good, you kind of look for the flaws and maybe they become a little bit more glaring over time. And the accessibility, uh, Jubal, I know that's something we want to hit on. The accessibility is like the gold standard in this game. Yeah. When I played the original one, I was playing a lot of Destiny. Bungie is known for their precision, their fast paced shooting and all this kind of stuff. And it really does definitely is a shooter's shooter, you know, and when you're playing The Last of Us and it, you know, it goes 20 years later and it shows a hungover Joel sitting up, it definitely seems to play like somebody who is in his late 40s who might have an onset of arthritis. And so in a weird way, I feel like it's grounded. The gameplay in The Last of Us, you feel like you're a person. You know, you don't feel like a super soldier or an alien or something like that. You know, it's so when you're under pressure and you raise your gun, the reticle shifts a little bit, you know, and, you know, so it's kind of hard to get a lot of precision. So sometimes you have to figure out another way. And that's why there's the stealth element. And that's when enemy AI and that kind of thing comes really important. I know that one of the criticisms I saw against this game and the original is that the enemy AI is dumb. You know, like the idea that you can basically walk up to somebody from the side and they still don't see you. I noticed that that's not the case when you play on New Game Plus, and I wish this is something that they implemented from the start, you can customize the difficulty. So you can basically turn up the intelligence of the enemy AI and leave everything else the same if you want. And all of a sudden, they're, they start getting a lot smarter. Yeah. Don't no, start yeah. with the highest. Actually, what I started doing uh, in New Game Plus is I put everything on highest difficulty, but then I put the uh, resources on very easy. So everything's really hard, but then I have lots of stuff I can work with, and that's been a lot mm. of fun. Accessibility. Josh, you said you uh, mentioned that you're colorblind. Did you use that feature? I do. I have it turned on on the PlayStation on all my games, so and it mm. works really well. Oh, good. I've been seeing news articles and stuff about people who are saying that The Last of Us 2 is the first game they've been able to finish without help. Wow. That's pretty incredible. Yes, I highly recommend Steve Saylor. He's a blind gamer on YouTube. He does an amazing video blog about The Last of Us 2, about colorblindness. He's blind hence his name. But using all these tools, you can obviously talk to this better than I can, but I highly recommend checking him out. There is an association that has a list of all the games that are good for people who have handicaps. This is to them one of the gold standards. The fact that Naughty Dog took the time, this wasn't added in at the end, this was baked in and it shows. And even for people like me, who reflexes aren't the best, 
like I, I'm a closed captioning guy. I use closed captioning on everything I watch. The fact that I can make it nice and big, which is great. Usually it's smaller, but you can change the color. Also, I end up playing the game with a feature where it's slowed down time. So when you drew your gun or any weapon, everything came to like it was max pain. Like, like the Matrix. It, nice. It's so much fun. And <laughs> I think I will play New Game Plus maybe without it. But I discovered this like an hour in. To me, it was really intense, especially when you had clickers all charging you and you're reloading in slow motion and you just got to get it. And for me, it was fun because my reflexes suck. That's why I'm not an online player because I stink at it. I just want to enjoy the story sometimes. I don't want to be stuck in a thing for an hour. I mean, that happens, but I don't want it to be the norm. But anyway, accessibility, I think, is just amazing what they've done with this game. And definitely check out The Blind Gamer. I think he's the guy who got in the news because he cried, because he got to beat it. I believe he's the same person. Wow. That's amazing. I think that, too, with gameplay, they did this a little bit with the first one, but you basically, you know, except for the uh, prologue where you play as uh, Joel's daughter, Sarah, you play as Joel through the whole game, except for the winter chapter where you play as Ellie part of the time. And there's that, you know, what's interesting is the tension kind of wraps up because there's a point where you're going back and forth between Joel and Ellie. Like that moment where Joel falls off the horse and Ellie's just like, tell me what to do. I need to know, you know, help. Fade to black and then you wake up and it's winter and she's in the woods and she's hunting and you're kind of playing as her as like there's this dual feeling of this is crazy I'm Ellie now and also is Joel dead <laughs> you know and so Naughty Dog is so good at making you hold two thoughts and feelings simultaneously I think that they took that element and built like the entire sequel out of it it was really a risk on their part to do it this way. But still talking about gameplay, you have two characters. You play as Ellie and Abby. And I would say that Ellie controls exactly how she did in the first game, except with four years of training and, and growth, you know, and so she's more nimble. She's quieter. She doesn't have a breakable shiv. She has her knife, you know. And then when you play Abby, you definitely feel like a soldier. And they kind of give you that little tease of her at the beginning where she's in the, you know, following Owen, you know, and then when you fight some infected and it's just like one haymaker punch and then a curb stomp and they're down, you're like, oh man, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like Joel without the arthritis, you know, so right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the shivs are back, that whole thing, you know, you're not just playing two people with different names and different skins. The, the mechanics are different between the two. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I'm going to circle back. I want to go to the AI, which will go into Abby and the gameplay. I don't know if you guys remember, during last year's E3, when they showed the presentation of the game, Neil Druckmann made a very interesting comment. We all know why now, but it stuck with me. He was saying how the NPCs are going to have names. They're going to have lives. They're going to care for each other. If you kill this NPC and another NPC sees it, they all have names. And if they don't hear each other over the radio, they'll come looking for them. And if they see them dead they're going to get pissed. I always thought that was weird. I'm like, okay, is Neil Druckmann telling us this is the first time when we kill an NPC, we should care about that thing. And it always brings me back to the argument that people would have with the Uncharted series. Nathan Drake is a stone cold killer. He right. mows down tons of people. But I'm like, yeah, but it's a fun romp. Yeah, he kills people. But Indiana Jones killed people too at some point. Did we really care? I totally get the argument people were trying to make. But I was like, Nathan Drake's not a killer because he isn't an arsenal. He's picking up guns to evade people trying to kill him. He's trying to protect himself. In this game, you have an arsenal. So you kind of are a killer. It's kill or be killed in this world. I'm like, is he trying to address a criticism of the Uncharted series? Like, what is he getting at? Now we know, big time, we get to play the NPCs. We get to learn the NPCs live. We get to learn all about the NPCs. And you're totally right. Um, Abby playing as a soldier. And it was interesting when you had a flashback of her, you're seeing her young and then mm -hmm. she just gets beefed up. You're right. Like she's a tank in that world. You have to be, there's no way you're going to go on the front line if you're not a tank. And just to watch Ellie get skinnier and skinnier is heartbreaking. Also, when I first played Abby that very first time, I thought this is an interesting way to show us combat for the controller and how to learn the moves. Because in Ellie's story right now, there's no reason to do this. So I thought that was their clever way of showing us how to do all the moves. I honestly, mm -hmm. that's what I really thought because I didn't know what was going to happen. 
I, I don't know what you guys thought, but that first time playing Abby, I'm like, this is a tutorial in a way. I thought it was brilliant. A, I mean, there's been games where we've had to choose between character types. I think like Street Fighter, or even going back mm -hmm. that far, Mortal Kombat. Right. You know, this guy's fatter and he hits harder and this girl is fast and she does that. But this was really interesting the way that they introduced that, Brian, to your point, when you're trying to chase the zebra down yeah. and cut the cord so that it gets free. That's not a fighting scenario. There's nothing besides your compassion that it's evoked in that scene. I thought exactly that idea of her getting skinnier and skinnier as she's on the road. And, you know, now you're worried about, you know, this pregnant girl with her baby. Like there's stuff that's just not incorporated into most fighting games. And as you say, The Last of Us, it's right there in the title. This world is kill or be killed. But the definition of what The Last of Us means changes greatly from the first game to the second game. Like, I don't know about you guys, but some of the baggage I brought in is The Last of Us is Joel and Ellie. It's Joel and Ellie mm -hmm. to the end of the earth and back again, which justifies why Joel made his choice, which I certainly think is something that we need to talk about at some point. That's the baggage we walk out of at the end is that Joel essentially sacrificed the human race because he missed his daughter and had developed a love for this child, you know, that's a surrogate daughter for him now. And would any of us make any different choice in that scenario? Did we make a different choice? We actually played it. Like, mm -hmm. that became our choice, and we were okay with it at the end of the first one. I don't know about you guys, I'm speaking for you, but I was okay with that choice. I was okay. Of yeah. I was too, uh, you know, and then of course I can also see the other side, you know, and I mean, it's a philosophical thing where there's no good answer. There's no right or that's what Last of Us 2 is. It forces us to see the other side. Yeah, and, and yeah. some of that criticism about it has been the fact that they felt that, like they didn't have a choice, you know, and I was like, well, that isn't this kind of game. There are games where you do have choices, but this is a game where you are playing through an inevitability. There is going to be one ending, and you're going to get to that ending, and there was never advertised as anything different. So the fact that it makes us uncomfortable and we come up with all kinds of rationale, why are we uncomfortable now? When we're not uncomfortable as Nathan Drake hosing down people, you know, with bullets, a lot of it is because the stakes are different in this. And like you say, they give their different names. And uh, I saw some videos of the dogs and the dog handlers, and I just freaking hated the dogs so they can smell at you out and everything. But if you shoot one of the soldiers and not the dog and you're able to kind of get back away, the dog whines and like yeah. nuzzles the guy, you know, the dead soldier. And is just That's like, awful. It just creates killing like this, the dogs was the worst. Yeah. That's generally the way we feel. It's like killing the dogs are the worst, but killing the humans doesn't feel that way. But just because the dogs are essentially brought into the situation and they're used as tools and they're only doing it because they're trained. I mean, you could argue that the humans are too, but the dogs don't have like a moral dilemma that they have to push through and a rationale. They're doing it because they love their humans and they're trying to protect their pack. That's why it feels so bad. Although I actually felt sniping a dog was a hard thing to do. But if one was like trying to eat my face off of I didn't really care, you know. <laughs> I hated that first time I had to kill a dog. I yeah. hated it. Normally, I it's a game. I don't think anything of it, but I mm -hmm. at that point I did. I hated it. Also, later on, when we learn these dogs have names, Alice, Bear, and Alice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, then your heart breaks because you're like, oh shit, I killed those dogs. Well, right. and they do it so cruelly. Like after you've already killed the dog, making that kind mm -hmm. of anonymized choice, Jewel, to your point. Mm -hmm. Now you have to like go and watch the love that these people have for this dog. And you're like, oh, Alice is such a good dog. And you're, yeah. you pet the dog. They make you pet the dog. Right. The squeaky toy. Throw, throw the throw ball. It, you know. Yeah. Throw the ball. It's brutal. Yeah. yeah. I had a little, a, thankfully brief, because I hate having long arguments on Twitter. Somebody saying, oh, you know, Naughty Dog is just like, it's just a cheap manipulation. This whole thing with the dogs. And I'm just saying, well, all stories are a manipulation. What a writer is doing is trying to make you believe that you have an emotional stake in something that is happening. If you've ever cried over a movie, you're being manipulated, you know? Yeah. Why is this any more crass than anything else? Plus, I still don't regret as Ellie killing that dog because it was my life or hers. I cared about the dog later because this is a game about contexts, empathy through showing context. Ellie's context of that dog was that this here's a dog coming around the corner trying to kill me. Abby's context for that dog was that these dogs are important as a soldier uh, for us to be able to survive a given mission. Plus, I'm a dog lover. One of my favorite moments is with Lev and Abby. I don't want to go too far on this because that's kind of a little bit later, but Lev has told Abby that he's afraid of dogs. Alice walks up and she's just like, it's okay. Just, you know, put your hand out and it's fine. It's not going to bite you. I promise. The context for dogs has now changed for Lev because he can see Abby's context for that dog. I think that the whole thing about dogs is one of the most important through lines in the whole of The I Last agree. of Us too. Yeah. 
So we should maybe get into the story officially here, huh? <laughs> I wonder if we should take a couple minutes and just talk about the storyline, like because there may be some people who've listened that don't play it and don't plan on it. So spoilers, of course, but mm -hmm. just to put it in perspective, what Brian is talking about, there were two characters that we cared about in the first Last of Us, and that's Joel and Ellie. Everyone else was secondary to that. And the situation is there's been a pandemic <laughs> Great game to play during the middle of a pandemic, by the way, uh, where es essentially, and that's how it starts off, a lot of people die, they become infected, and they become monsters. And the longer that they're alive as monsters, they become even more monstrous. And so governments fall apart, society has barely recollected itself when you start play this way. And there's one person in the world who has been bitten by one of these things who has not been impacted by, who has not turned into one of them, and that's Ellie. And she's a young girl, like 14 years old. And so Joel mission, if he accepts it, is to take Ellie and protect her as they journey across the country to Utah, uh, where this group called the Fireflies have enough medical resources and scientific experience that they can actually extract something from Ellie and create a vaccine that can cure the human race from this terrible, terrible virus. When he gets there, Joel learns that Ellie has to be killed in order to extract this virus, uh, and he does not allow that to happen. He, in fact, murders several people during that time, one of them being the primary scientist and doctor who could produce this vaccine who ends up having a daughter named Abby. And that's who we meet in the beginning of uh, Last of Us 2. And obviously she has a vested interest in taking a golf club to Joel's head to end his life. And that's act one. That's like what, yeah. an hour into the game. <laughs> so there we are. We start there. The first thing that we see is Joel admitting to Tommy that he basically he did this. His brother, Tommy, who is a big figure from the first game as well. But he is cleaning up a guitar. One of the promises that he made to Ellie late in the first game is that he was going to teach her how to play guitar. One of his big dreams was to be a singer. And she made him promise that he'd sing for her. And he promised her later that he'd teach her to play. So the, you, the first thing you see is this guitar. And he's cleaning it up and he's talking to Tommy and basically admitting that, yeah, I just doomed us all to save Ellie. I love this moment. It's just the acting is just incredible. And the motion capture and the animation for that matter. But when Tommy gets up and walks away... You can see on Joel's face that he's like, oh, God, is Tommy pissed? Tommy just kind of is shocked and then just wanders off. And then it takes all of that beautiful ride back in town as Jackson, Wyoming. Tommy stops Joel before they split up and says that I can't say I would have done any different. I don't know what happened. I was supposed to take her to the Fireflies and walk away. go halfway across the country with someone. She needed her immunity to mean something. Maybe I was starting to buy into that old cure business. Maybe I just wanted to do right by her. And then we made it. He found the firefly. Because of her, they were actually going to make a cure. The only catch. It would kill her. So what he said, I'll take it to my grave. I'll take it to my grave, yeah. And then there's this beautifully awkward scene, because this is a basically a two-year flashback. This game has a lot of flash forwards and flashbacks. Joel and Ellie have been in this town about a year, and Future Days, it's a Pearl Jam song, right? Is it? I don't know. Yeah. It made yeah. me cry. Whatever it was, I was in tears. Yeah, it had me just bawling, because, again, talking about context, the context of the lyrics absolutely killed me. Just the idea that if I ever were to lose you, I would lose myself. That was just a beautifully played scene. You know, Ellie's the consummate 15 year old where he, like, he gets to the end of this tear drinking song and she's like, Well, that didn't suck. <laughs> 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 the reason why I bring that part of it up is because it drops us right back into why his choice in the original mattered to him. It puts us right back in Joel's shoes, even though we, you know, they give us a moment where we play as him. There is a reminder of this is what Joel has fought for is to just have a normal life, have a family and hopefully live to a ripe old age and die. Even though I think right. deep down, he kind of knows his days are numbered, you know, after everything that he's done. But he's let his guard down is the point. Because later he saves 
Abby, who's just somebody in trouble with an infected that's trying to kill her, and he saves her life. After she finds out who his name is, she says, oh, I have this house. We can go there and, you know, regroup. At that moment, they're walking through, and then Owen says, boy, you're lucky. And she says, you have no idea. And I thought, oh, shit. (laughs) And I mentioned talking about playing through an inevitability where he says, I'm Tommy, this is my brother Joel, and everyone leans forward. Because in their minds, this is a figure, this guy is Satan. Yeah. This guy wiped out an entire hospital full of fireflies, soldiers, this militia, and kills all these doctors, basically single-handedly murdered 20 people just in that one building. They're like, oh my God, this is him. Abby has this physicality. She's a very large, built person. She has spent her whole life from the moment of her father's death preparing for this, making herself into a weapon because she knows that anybody that took out that many people so ruthlessly and skillfully is going to be very difficult to deal with. You know, suddenly the situation was just handed to her. That moment just killed me because here's the thing about Joel, because I'm going to be saying a lot of things about Abby later. So I wanted to state for the record that Joel is one of my all time favorite protagonists. He's done some really horrendous things, but there's there's a lot about Joel, for instance, the fact that besides his face, he looks a lot like my dad. My my mom and dad passed away a few months ago, uh, about three weeks apart. You know, it was very sudden mm-hmm. and it, it was a very uh, kind of a traumatizing thing to go through because they were both in different hospitals sick at the same time. Oh, okay. So seeing Joel when he was giving Ellie the guitar and his his body just looks you know, it's just like my dad's body. When I remember him at his height, you know, in his late 40s or, you know, All right. So Joel is very dear to my heart. And so when he's killed in such a degrading way, I had to turn the game off. And I'm just like, well, fuck, what do I do now? <laughs> you know. Um, so it completely floored me. But I know that Naughty Dog, the producers of this game, knew that they had to make us hate Abby with every fiber of our being to actually pull the story off. It was graphic. It was really hard to watch, but they only showed you just enough. For example, when she finally lands the killing blow, his head's in the foreground out of focus. You see that little gout of blood, which is gruesome, but it's not gratuitous. Right. It's, uh, it's more on Ellie at that point. Like you're yeah. focused on her. You're focused on Ellie and El- the look on Ellie's face and, uh, oh my God, Ashley Johnson. Which was almost worse. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Ashley Johnson. Uh, what kills me is still the way her voice breaks when she says, please don't do this. She goes, please don't, please don't do it. And they're like, it's just kills me, you know? Yeah. Later, when they show that scene within Abby's context, you know, one thing that we'll probably talk about later is Abby's course of redemption. But when they show that scene later from Abby's perspective, you're focused on her face. She lands the killing blow. Shout out to Laura Bailey's performance, because what you see Mm -hmm. wash over her face is the adrenaline draining out and then an emptiness and a sadness and a realization that this didn't solve anything. Yes, that's exactly what I thought. I don't want to forget this, but I'll say when I finished this game, that's exactly what I felt. Mm -hmm. I felt like I didn't have a release. You finish a game, you feel relieved. I did not feel any of that normal feelings. I felt bottled up. That solved nothing. I didn't know if I achieved anything here. What year is this? Yeah. Yeah, Right? (laughs) That feeling, right? Yeah. 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 I had this realization when you finally see that final scene with Ellie and she realizes that she can't play guitar. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. And she has that flashback to her last conversation with Joel. You realize that none of this was really about Abby. This was the fact that she didn't get closure with Joel. Right. They were on the path. She says, I don't think I can forgive you for what you've done because earlier in the game, Joel finally fessed up to her about what he did. And she now has carrying all of this guilt what is inside my body could have saved the human race. And now that opportunity is gone and I am left empty. She and Joel have a blowout fight, you know, and then during this conversation, she says, I don't think I can ever forgive you for what you've done, but I would like to try. Yeah. And Joel says, I'd like that. And then she walks off thinking like we all do that. We're going to have plenty of time with our loved ones. And she never gets that. And that's the reason why I know we're jumping around here, but the game's nonlinear. So screw it. That's the reason why at the very end, she spares Abby because she gets this flash of Joel on the deck. And I think in that moment, the realization that Ellie knows this isn't about Abby. Right. It's about her and her relationship. But, oh my God, what a journey. Yeah, like um, the stick on the Joel and Ellie thing. Mm -hmm. I loved the flashback. I think it might have been the first one when they go to the dinosaur museum. Yeah. And it was kind of like this giraffe moment. For me, mm-hmm. in the first game, they see these giraffes out 
before they go to the hospital and it's kind of this surreal moment. It's kind of a calm, peaceful moment. Like life is still happening out there. It's bigger than us. Maybe there's a light out there and we'll all have a future together. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that scene could be interpreted different ways, but that's what I got out of it. But this being a young Ellie again and being the older Joel, not too old. It kind of looked like their avatars from the last game. He's giving her a birthday. That was a lot of fun. Going to T-Rex, jumping off of it, mm. playing with the hat. I want to say the storytelling in this one area just showed what gaming can do. It invoked a lot of emotion. The writing was just so good. The acting was so good. How the animation and the, the faces are just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, very reminiscent of uh, Left Behind when Ellie and Riley are playing the arcade game. She's right. like, well, it's broken. We can't play. Let's use our imagination. And they did that cool overlay where you saw their imagination and they were fighting each other. Mm -hmm. And you had that moment again, which was so magical. I've never seen it in a game before. It's her and the rocket ship and they're in the, the space capsule. He had finds an old tape of the rocket taking off and she puts it on and you see that look over her face and you're just so happy for them. This is like a great moment. Enjoy it because this possibly could be the last heartwarming moment you'll have together. Yeah, that stuff was just so, I hate to use this term, but it's almost like a Pixar film. Yeah. <laughs> Very heartwarming. It's a dark Pixar film, but still. <laughs> and the animation, I guess I, I'm comparing to the animation and the right. writing and the acting is just top notch for mm. that scene. When you extract it to the point when Joel gets his comeuppance, it's actually talking about you because you push the button every time you killed every thing on the screen. And so it's forcing you as a player to consider your own actions and whether you just went along with it because it's fun to kill stuff on the screen. It's a summation. Every button click, every movement you've ever made all sums up to that part and it, it converts over into emotion almost like a magic trick. Right. And suddenly now I'm not pushing buttons, but I have this entire emotional landscape that's happening inside of me because of what I'm looking at on the screen. And I'm more involved in this than almost any other entertainment channel or piece of content that I've ever engaged with. It's amazing. Right. This one extended story, part one and two, I don't think I have ever cried that much over a single story. Uh, not a know, video game, for yeah. sure. I remember back when I watched Six Feet Under, you know, hmm. there's some serious stuff in that that I might have teared up a lot but there's something about this where my partner Sarah walked in on me right at the very end of this and I'm just sitting there on the living room floor just sobbing you know and she's like oh my god it's like are you having fun and he's like I don't know if I call it fun but that was incredible you know <laughs> <Yeah>. but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but you know and that moment in the space capsule yeah that's it's like they really knew that they had to condense so much they knew that the loss of Joel at the beginning was going to be a hard pill for people to swallow. And I would argue that's maybe some of the blowback that they've gotten is oh, the fact so, that for sure. if everybody's grieving Joel, it's, it's actual grief. And it's exactly what you said, Josh, which yep. is like, there's something about playing this game where you're actually in their shoes literally, and you're making decisions that were set up for you, but you're choosing to play it. You know, people talk about the lack of agency in a game like this, but there is agency. You turn the thing on, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it. So there's that feeling, the the bargaining and the anger and all that kind of stuff, the five stages that the loss of Joel has. And then when you see that, oh, it's starting to sound like something there, you know, and she's playing guitar. And then that whole thing going through the museum, that's sort of a gift to us to kind of show that they did have their good moments because there's also a lot of drama that's around the choice that Joel made that comes later. But they wanted to show us what was probably their best day together. Yeah, totally. And also filling us in that she can swim now. That's pulling double duty, you know? <laughs> I love the Easter egg. You see the crate there. And she goes, oh, I don't need one of those anymore. Yeah. And I love the little callbacks. <laughs> I love it. And it was a feel-good moment. And you're right. It's sort of like a Lynch film. You mm -hmm. have a moment where it's fun and quirky and weird. And then you mm -hmm. have that moment that punches you in the face. And then it brings it back. And Lynch does that a lot in his work. We yeah. talk about that a lot. And it, yeah. this yeah. game does that constantly. Yeah, one of the funniest things in Lynch, I won't go much on a tangent, but one of the funniest things in Lynch that I think I've still ever seen is in Mulholland Drive, where you have the two dudes in that office. There's the assassin that kills the <laughs> yes. guy. It's like him riffing on the Coen brothers or something, you know? It's just like one of their screwball idiot movies, you know? <laughs>
there's moments like that in The Last of Us, which is pitch perfect because you need to have a little bit of that. And it's like later on with Abby around her fear of heights. She asks, you know, Lev, look, what are you afraid of? And he says, oceans and dogs. Yara says, wow, he really looks up to you. And she said, well, we bonded over our collective fear of dying. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Where should we go next with this? I want to make sure that we each have a definition of what we think the acoustic guitar means, because we've mentioned it a couple of times, but it's super important. It's a through line. And so I think we'll probably all quickly agree, but it's really important to pay attention to those acoustic guitar scenes. Right. Yeah. I have something to say about it. In the beginning of quarantine, I decided I'm going to teach myself to play guitar because my wife owns two guitars, acoustic guitars. I've been someone who's always wanted to, but never had the opportunity. So YouTube became my teacher and I've learned some really easy one string things. I loved the mechanic because it was like, holy shit, I'm trying to learn reading notes. I was like, wow, the detail in this guitar is absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. And the fact that I went on YouTube and you got Mark Hoppus from Blink-182 playing his own song on Twitch. Then you got <laughs> people doing Johnny Cash. And I'm like, that's how you play Hurt? I want to try that on a real guitar. So it's like, it taught me how to play it in a very simple way to play it. And then I would watch someone do it on YouTube and I'm like, I'm going to do it on the game. And then I'm going to do it in real life, which was wild. I'm going to touch upon this when she plays to Dina, aha, uh -huh, take on me. Mm. Um, growing up, I, I love the eighties music. I love schmaltzy, cheesy eighties. Mm -hmm. I'm a sucker for it. And that song to me was just like a fun, stupid song. Never thought too deeply about it. And I know the real meaning is about him and in love with a girl and yada, yada, yada. Like good art, it could have more than one meaning to someone. But obviously she plays it to Dina because she likes her and she's shy, you know, she's shy about the whole situation. She's going to interact with another female expressing her feelings and the romance is blossoming. So she plays the song. It's a beautiful song. And I thought it was foreboding. I thought lyrically it was telling us that she's asking Dina to be with her, but she might not be there forever. And I was just like, I'm not prepared to see Ellie die again in this game. Mm. I think this is what the song's telling me. Like good art, I think it has a double meaning. And I kind of now in retrospect to me, it did say she lost everything. It was Dina who was going to leave her. Ellie wasn't going to die, but Dina left her. And mm. that song kind of told me that something was going to happen. It's weird. I was on YouTube. I turned on AHA Unplugged and MTV, and they mm. played that song. And this is like 12 o'clock at night, and it brought me to tears for reasons. I mean, um, <laughs> I do know why. And my wife, who is sleeping beside me, just started bawling. And she's like, could you please turn off that song? And I was like, I can't. And she had a cry with me and on a personal side, it's something that happened to us. So that brought right. emotion out of both of us. To this day now, I look at that song totally different. Uh, the acoustic version is very beautiful, I think. And mm. it just changed that song. The meaning is changed for me forever because on a personal level, but the game too. And it was just weird how... Whatever you're watching or doing just spills into the real world and oh, affects yeah. you in a weird sure. way. Absolutely. Soundtracks in particular. So think about the Twin Peaks soundtrack for yeah. The Return. Like those mm -hmm. songs are just infused mm -hmm. with those images and those emotions in that moment. When you hear Lissy sing 
you know, wild, wild west, mm-hmm. man, that's just, it just puts you right there. So I'm with you, man. Uh, it was a hell of a choice of a song. Gustavo Santalala, the composer for both soundtracks for The Last of Us, is it's all based around stringed instruments and guitars and banjos and stuff like that. In fact, he has a cameo near near the beginning. He's he's the guy that's playing the banjo in the, in uh, oh, Jackson. Oh, cool! Yeah, I bought this soundtrack, but I have a vinyl collection. It's a four Ooh. record collection from the first one, and they put out a, a little forty five with a couple songs from the second one. Highly recommend it. if you can get mm-hmm. your hands on those. It's phenomenal. Yeah. The guitar is uh, specifically as a symbol. There's the moth on the neck of the guitar. Obviously, she doesn't have a tattoo one year into her stay in Jackson, but later she has moths and ferns tattooed on her arm over the scar. I think that the guitar and the scar are tied into each other. You know, the fact that she got this bite that was a symbol of, of her immunity and she burned it off with acid to, in order to fit into this community and keep that part a secret. And she covered it with a tattoo with a moth from the guitar that Joel gave her. Yeah. Layers of meaning literally on her flesh, you know. Yeah. Excellent. Her losing those fingers and not being able to play guitar again. Broke me. Heartbreaking. It broke me too. That's the through, you're right, the through line between her and Joel. And she lost that. Was it worth it? Yeah. Now you lost another connection. And not only did Dina leave you, but you lost this too. It was a heavy moment and Mm -hmm. it was heartbreaking because I was like, well, she would always have the guitar no matter what. That moment at the end was heartbreaking. And she doesn't even bother to put it back in its case. Yeah, it's, it's worthless at that point. To me, the guitar, you know, it, why do we live? Why do we work? Why do we, you know, love? Why do we have families? It's so yeah. that we can express joy in a moment, right? And mm-hmm. I think that art in general, but the guitar specifically embodying art, is one of the few moments of joy that Joel had. I mean, that was just his way to express who he was as a creative being beyond just murdering infected and protecting, you know, his family. And so that's what gets killed when you give yourself over to violence and revenge. And I think that's a deeply embedded into the story. Right. And both of them have suffered so much trauma emotionally and have had so much loss. So that's what's so poignant about that awkward scene towards the beginning, that sweet scene where he gives her the guitar is because, yeah, the only reason he probably could have courage to even walk through that door is because he promised her that he'd teach her to play guitar, you know, and to come in and talk to her, basically express his feelings to her. One of the single moments that is probably my favorite in the whole game is when he does sit down and he puts the guitar on his knee and he says, promise me that you won't laugh. And he looks up at her like, mm. I'm, I'm dead serious. <laughs> if you laugh, it will kill me. What's this? Some folks call this thing here a guitar. Funny. You want to hear something? Okay. Okay. Promise me that you won't laugh. I won't laugh. I won't. I'm trusting you. That is definitely a symbol of the connection that they have because one of the first things that after they escape the cannibalistic rapists from the first game, <laughs> um, the, you know, that's the moment that she becomes his daughter is when, you know, she manages to survive the attack of David and kill him. And then Joel says, oh, baby girl. There was a, a podcast where Neil Druckmann was interviewed and he said that he told Troy Baker, the actor, I don't care what you say in that moment to her, but you have to say, oh, baby girl. Because that is the moment that she becomes his daughter. All that scar tissue that he had, you know, and it's, again, that song that he sings, all these stolen, broken parts I have no need for anymore, you know, and that, that's when in the song that he sings to her. I know, I'm, I'm just getting emotional thinking about heavy, heavy stuff, man. It's mm-hmm. heavy stuff. Yeah. To piggyback on the second flashback when Joel and Ellie are at the hospital, what do you guys think about, like, when they're back at the hospital? Uh, I was like, oh, my God, mm. this, is, this is interesting, turn of events. And she goes on her own. They're camping out and she kind of like, I'm going to go check this out myself. And she stumbles upon the x-ray. She stumbles upon the tape recorder, which is an old collectible from the first game, which is is kind of neat that brought that back. Mm -hmm. And she listens to it and how it just broke her to hear this. It's not even Joel told her. She found out. 
Mm -hmm. And then he told her, that makes it worse. Her discovering the truth on her own and then confronting Joel about that. That was a fantastic scene. She gave him multiple opportunities to come clean and he obfuscated to save himself and save his relationship, save his sense of safety. His relationship with Ellie is all tied up in the idea, I just want to feel secure again. And that ultimately is his downfall because he saved Abby because she was a person in trouble. And Tommy's like, hey, go back and restock. We'll get you some food. The idea that these probably people aren't here to kill us. But he let his guard down. What did Bill say in the first game? Uh, a friend of Joel's that was by himself, he said, as soon as you start caring for somebody, that's when everything's over. There's no way to have security and care for other people. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's where survival ends and living begins, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're living, you have something to lose. When you're surviving, right. every moment is a victory, <laughs> right. right? I will say that I was actually relieved when that happened earlier rather than later because my fear for this game was that that was going to be the story of Ellie finding out about this horrible thing oh. Joel had done and coming to grips with that. And uh, in the years that we've had to kind of build up to what this was going to be, I was like, hey, do I really want to play that for 30 hours? Mm. I don't. And I didn't have to. So yeah. it's great. This is one of those stories, you know, when people are saying, oh, I can't believe they killed Joel. You know, it's just like, well, how can you not believe they killed Joel? You, you know, you've seen this story. Everybody is going to suffer in this game. One thing that Neil Druckmann was asked was, what was your inspiration for this particular story? And he said, well, if the first one was about love, about finding love again in this situation, this is a game about hate. Later on, he said, I lied. It's still about love. What do you think he means? Well, that was his choice, right? I mean, that was the choice he made. It wasn't necessarily a choice between love and hate, but it was a choice for love. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think he realizes that there are going to be repercussions that come with that choice, and they're going to be based in hatred, and rightly so. I, mm -hmm. I feel like Joel has resigned himself to his fate at that mm -hmm. point, um, right. living on borrowed time. The saying is there's a fine line between love and hate, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you love someone unconditionally, you have these emotions and sometimes it can come to hate. Like you hate them for something, but you still love them. And Ellie still loved Joel. We felt that we saw mm -hmm. that, but she was a teenager. She's trying to discover herself. She's trying mm -hmm. to stick up for herself. She wants to be her own person because Joel took that away from her becoming something bigger than herself. And now she has to live with that, but she wants to love him again. And she hates him at the moment because he lied. But I don't think their bond broke. I think it will scab over. I think if things didn't happen, they would be closer together. But she would always have this resentment, maybe, or this hatred deep down that would bother her. If we we're in a situation, I feel like we'd all be like a little resentful towards that person. You're like, oh, I'm alive right now, so I'm thankful. But at the same time, I could have saved a bunch of people. So it's a mixed bag. It makes the player feel emotions you normally wouldn't feel playing a game. This game to me is just a world of gray. There's no black and white here. We get through the first half of the game. This is where it comes down to Naughty Dog having some serious guts. They built this whole crescendo up. Jesse dies unceremoniously, gets shot in the face, go through the door, you know, in this safe haven of this theater. The door opens, Jesse gets shot, and then, oh my God, Abby's here. How the hell did they find us? And she says to her, we spared your life and you wasted it. Fade to black, and now it's four years earlier, and you're playing Abby as a girl. <laughs> I was pissed. I was, I Me was, too. how can I get through this? To say it real quickly, I was pissed. I was confused. Sick to my stomach because I don't want their stories to interject again. In my mind, I'm going, Ellie's going to die, but they're giving us context, and then we were going to feel conflicted, and oh my God. So part of me is just like, I never want Abby's story to end because I never wanted to get to that point. Mm. That was my first reaction. Sure. Yeah, I think that's totally valid. I mean, you feel manipulated. Manipulated in a way that you feel a creator's hand just has said, nope, don't think about that. You need mm. to think about this. Yeah. It's like, uh, I guess in that moment in Clash of Titans where they pick up little Perseus's guy and just set him on the beach and you're like, I don't want to be on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing two things. One is I don't want to be Abby. And then two is they just left a set of cliffhangers. Like this is something that you're quote unquote not supposed to do as a writer is completely stop your momentum. Right. Mm. <laughs> it grinds to a halt and starts over effectively. But not really because you wake up. I thought it was interesting. She was reading City of Thieves. 
Abby's a reader. She's, an, I guess, an avid reader. I think there's a moment, I never saw it, but there's a moment where she goes by a bookstore and she says, all these books, you know, and it's just like, no, Abby, focus, or something like that. She wakes up and then there's Manny, the guy who spit on Joel. And you come out and they give you one of the greatest set pieces in the game, which is that stadium. What the amazing way to repurpose a stadium. Yeah. I love how they're cutting off all this ideas. We're like, how can somebody get so buff in the apocalypse? You know, and she walks out the door of the library and there's the gym, you know? Gym, yeah. <laughs> yeah, huge gym. And then you turn the corner and there's like a kindergarten. And across the hall from the kindergarten, that's where they're teaching the high schoolers and they're learning about horticulture and growing things, you know? So they have built this whole society. Yes, it's militaristic. Yes, they're torturing people downstairs. That was an interesting little uh, thing to kind of put in there because you start to think that, wow, they're kind of building a bit of a utopia. Yeah, it's kind of regimented, a little bit closer to the military than I like, but it seems like they got their shit together. You kind of get into the bowels of the thing and you realize that, okay, so this is where they're kind of, they just do this dance with the grays, you know, the shades of gray. Just when they make you maybe side with her a little bit, they also remind you a little bit of what Abby has done or the society that she's a part of. But now you're being reintroduced to everybody in the room, most of whom Ellie have killed at this point. I skip around a little bit in some of the YouTube Let's Plays to just see how people react to different key moments. One of the things I thought was interesting is the idea is like, no, I don't want to know these people. You're rejecting it because you want to see her as the bad guy. And I think that some people played the whole game determined to hate it. And they never let Abby in, so to speak. But I think that most people, it's like by the end, you know, it's just, again, I told you that Joel reminds me uncomfortably of my own father. And I love Abby. I love Abby too. Uh, yeah. And I love Ellie. Yeah. I love yeah. Ellie yeah. Too. Too. I was conflicted anytime you had control of either of them. I was so conflicted to the point of made me sick. I didn't want to play it anymore. I was like, I'm going to die on purpose because maybe mm -hmm. something else would happen. <laughs> I, I don't know, but... I didn't like it. I didn't like that yeah. at all. I saw one reviewer, it was with a video reviewer, that talked about, wouldn't it be crazy if you get to that final thing and then they have it where you switch back and forth and you can control Ellie or Abby, but no matter who wins, it's just still game over. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's but you know it's of... interesting with Abby is that we start off inside her trauma, A, because it's the trauma we've essentially caused. Yeah. We push those buttons that killed yeah. that guy long ago, by the way. So this is years ago as gamers, most of us that, that have played it. Like that was a decision I made five years ago on a button I pressed when I was a different person. Right. And now that decision has impacted this character. We start off inside her trauma as opposed to like if she were a good person and something bad happened to her and then we, mm -hmm. we understand that. No, we're right in the middle of a pain that we caused. And now we have to understand that this character is flawed because of that. Like everything she does is is acting from that trauma and it's just a unique way to play in a video game right she blows up all of her own relationships you know she she has this boyfriend that every time things start, kind of start to get serious with owen she's like i gotta go train i can't put my happiness before my need for justice right she's still young you know but i mean the thing is is she's wrecking her own life over this it's just the idea that there's more than one way to lose your life to a killer you know it's like mm. she, she has built Joel up to this point where he's like a demon, like I said earlier. I think that Joel didn't live up to that, and he has this sort of pathetic death. You know, that's another thing people are angry about is that he doesn't have this heroic death, you know, and it's just like, but no, it needs to be yeah. sad. Yeah, I mean, there's no heroes in this Not, world. Absolutely. There, I mean, they're normal people trying to survive. So if Joel were to die, he could potentially die of something stupid he did. A clicker could get him. I mean, mm -hmm. he would die in the most boring way if Abby hadn't killed him. How else would he have died, right? In a helicopter blowing people yeah. with a disease? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point because, you know, this is something that a game does that no other medium does, which is the fact that you have a reset button on a death. Joel does die hundreds of times. <laughs> it's just that we go back to the last save point. Right, yeah, right, right. right. There's no emotional save point in this game. <laughs> right, <laughs> like you right. can't undo that damage that's happened right. emotionally. What made me like Abby, I don't know what the turning point for you guys were, but for me, you see their whole utopia. That was cool. I don't know, like it's beautiful. They go on a run and everything. But that first flashback when she's younger with her dad, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, my God, she's got a type. She's a daddy's girl because Owen – is a big goober like her dad was. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, that's a nice touch because games, you don't think of, like usually in shows and movies make maybe the husband kind of look like a similar version of her dad. And for a game to do that, I yeah. noticed it right away. I'm like, oh, Jerry, this yeah. Jerry guy, I didn't know he was a doctor yet because you yeah. have this flashback and they have the zebra and he's collecting coins. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, oh my God, he's just like 
Owen. He's like this big goober guy, yeah. this big dork. He doesn't want to be part of this world. He wants to go on his own. He seems like a very genuine, nice person, and he's sick of fighting. He has love for Abby, but she doesn't want to reciprocate that back. So he doesn't know what to do. So he gets involved with someone else. But you, he does it out of maybe convenience because what? Well, the girl I do like doesn't want to be with me. Well, remember, uh, she was pregnant. So yes, like, yeah, yeah. A- Abby is somebody, when we meet her, who things have happened to her far outside of her control. Right, right, right. right. That flashback for me made me like Abby learning her backstory with her dad and everything. It gave me context of who she was and then learning, seeing the scene, dealing with this PTSD that Ellie will have later on. She's dealing with that with her dead dad. She's having these nightmares. She has PTSD. I'm sure a lot of these characters do and they deal with that, which is something games don't normally do either in a story like this. For me, I fell in love with her character. I fell in love with her world after that flashback. I I don't know where it hit for you guys. That was it, absolutely. And I think the thing for me is the way that all the characters there show compassion for the the hurting zebra. It's one of the cheapest tricks a a writer can do is to put an animal in peril and and, you know make human beings show compassion for it but it's mm. so effective and it worked really well a it paint helped paint the scene that normally zebras don't really walk through parks so you know we're, we're still in the penumbra of human society collapsing but it doesn't preclude human compassion for nature and for suffering and when you build a character right from there and then show, you know, this decision that we've made that has impacted her life so terribly. Uh, it was it was a really interesting turning point for me. And I had compassion for Abby from that moment on. Yeah. And, and the, I, I love the fact that that zebra is from the same zoo that the giraffes are from. You know. Yes. Another callback. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. For me, actually, it was a small moment where I started to not be angry that I was Abby. I, I, I kind of let it go pretty quick, but she was standing in line for lunch and then Manny comes up, butts in line, you know, and he says, what? you know, it's like, what are you doing? Oh, you're so embarrassing. He's breaking the social code that you stand in line. You realize that she is a compassionate person. Manny, remember, was the one that was immediately just going to shoot Ellie in the face and as uh, the one that spit on Joel. I actually liked Manny all right, just their their banter with Abby. I liked him, but he is arguably a sociopath, you know, <laughs> in ways that Abby and Owen are not. And also when you see, I mentioned it before, where you see the moment after she kills Joel and realizing the emptiness of that decision, on some level, maybe not consciously, but you can see it on her face, uh, you note that Owen is in the background arguing to spare Tommy and Ellie. Even Mel is, you know, the medic wants to kill them and to tie up the loose ends. That would be the prudent thing to do in a situation like that is to tie up the loose ends. You know, that ultimately ends up being everybody's downfall is to just let them go. So that's what that point where you're just realizing that people are making these decisions and then you see the repercussions of those decisions. And then those are the things that we wrestle with deciding who is right and wrong when really that's not the right question here. I don't think it's not an issue of good and bad, you know, um, you know, I mean, there's an argument that could be made that Abby is the hero of the story. Like, I don't think there's a hero and villain in the in the whole thing, but she's she spares Ellie's life twice. You know, Joel kills her dad and Ellie kills all of her friends. Yeah, I don't see there being a hero in this world. It's gray. There's mm-hmm. no heroes and villains. It's people surviving. Right. And I think when you're in a situation where people have to survive, it's killed or be killed. You have these factions, tribalisms, these people mm-hmm. all putting their own flag in their ground and mm-hmm. they're going to defend it no matter what. It's weird. They want to live in peace and harmony, but at the same time, they know they got to kill others if there's a disruption in that. Isaac says that, well, we tried a truce. The truce is going to be broken by somebody on one side or the other. So let's just wipe them out. Well, that's madness for one thing, but that's something that is definitely what we do in this world. You know, I know that Neil Druckmann is from Israel. You know, he grew up in Israel and I'm sure that in his mind is that idea of two factions fighting over a plot of land. Uh, or several centuries of conflict and then no end in sight. I know that they took great pains to make sure that the Seraphites slash scars were not supposed to be evocative of any one faith. They weren't trying to make an argument against a specific group of people in the real world. They hired experts to fabricate a cult that doesn't necessarily resemble anything specific. I love that. Yeah, Yeah. and I liked how that cult, it's not a focus of the story, but I love how it's a background that everybody's dealing with. They're kind of a menace. They want to 
eradicate everybody else and they have this woman as the leader there. It was nice and it wasn't the focus. It was in mm-hmm. the backdrop. You can learn more about it by reading the letters, mm-hmm. uh, seeing the artwork on the walls, the graffiti. Mm-hmm. And obviously with Lev, we get to go to where they're from. But mm-hmm. it's like they brought in all these people, but it felt seamless. It didn't feel like it was too much. It was just like a nice gradual mm-hmm. thing. I guess just to touch upon this, they kill the leader very, like, nonchalantly. She just dies. They have the whole thing go on fire. Mm-hmm. But the, the woman being killed, it, was like, it wasn't like a big thing. She didn't see it coming. She dies. They light up the place. We move on. She wasn't the prophet either. The prophet, of course, is long dead. You know, Lev gives us some interesting context where he says, like, you read the scripture and it talks about the idea of fear is the strength and weakness. And when he gives her that little speech about just kind of own your fear, just realize that when you're afraid, it's your body preparing yourself for what's coming. He kind of does little moments like that where he'll mention things and like, uh, wow, that sounds really wise. Lev's like, yeah, and then everyone screwed it up. The prophet passed away and then now we have people are misinterpreting the scripture. And that's something that all of us can realize that that's basically the idea of doctrine becoming the focus over whatever the original intent was. But Lev and Yara, yeah, that moment where Abby is overtaken by the Seraphites and then wakes up and is basically lynched. Let's talk about that. <laughs> what was your reaction to that? Well, especially now, like, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. given what's happened in the past six weeks in America, to be forced to be put in a position where you're essentially hanging from your neck, mm-hmm. um, being executed was uh, pretty emotional for me. I don't know about you guys. Um, and then you fight for your way out of it. The whole thing where, you know, clipper wings where they break Yara's elbow and Lev comes out and is trying to help Yara and Yara just says, cut her down. I rewatched that a little bit. And I was kind of thinking, why do you think Yara says that? And you realize that we're going to need help. Abby was able to grab the lady and like essentially start choking her out with her thighs. And then Yara is able to hit her in the head with a hammer. And that's the reason why both of them are alive. Trauma bonding in a way is kind of how it starts. But then you start to realize each other's humanity. I just love that moment where Abby picks Yara up and takes her to the trailer. There's the moment where she says to Lev, that guys better be gone in the morning because this place is going to be overrun probably with people looking for you. Lev says, we'll be fine and closes the door. And then Abby's kind of like, yeah, okay. And then, But there's this look on her face. She feels that there's a connection and then just kind of wants to reject it. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was I was surprised that she went back for them. Yeah. I didn't think that was going to happen. Yeah, it was like that moment in No Country for Old Men. Llewellyn Moss wakes up in the morning and remembers the guy in the truck that he left who wanted water. And so against his better judgment, he gets a jug of water and goes out there and that ends up being the decision that unravels everything. In this situation, it's the decision that arguably is her redemption. Yeah, Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's significant that she sees their suffering within the context of her greatest suffering, which was when her father was killed. So that dream, obviously, they're hanging from the noose inside of the very room that her father was taken away from her in. I mean, just the emotion of that alone raises the importance and the prioritization level of her saving those two people at that moment. Doesn't she have, tell me if I'm wrong, I don't remember, but she has another dream where when she opens that door, everything's fine. Her dad's not hanging. And is that the moment she realizes she needs to go back? Or that happens later on? Later. That's later, yeah. After the very angry sex with Owen, she wakes up oh. in the morning. <laughs> she wakes up in the morning. They both needed that, you know that. But, uh, but uh, yeah. she woke yeah. up in the morning and saw, instead of her father dead, saw Yara and Lev hanging. And then wakes up and says, those kids, you know, and then goes out to get them. That whole thing, I just loved it. For, for one thing, of course, we have a trans character for the first time in a AAA game, as far as I'm aware. With Lev, the idea of being essentially an apostate, you're going to be executed because you shaved your head. You were pledged as a wife to one of the elders and you wanted to be a soldier. You make this decision to shave your head like the men and that is the reason why this whole cult is out for your blood. For a long time, I didn't understand why he was questioning the laws, the traditions. When he explained to me how he felt inside, I told him he had to keep it to himself. I was hoping he'd snap out of it. He seemed fine for a while. But then he shaved his head, like one of the men. It was suicide. 
there's something that resonates with Abby there. I wonder what that is. Yeah, I, I don't know that there's anything that correlates directly, like, you know, Abby struggle with her own gender identity mm -hmm. or anything like that. I, did, yeah. I didn't get that impression. Yeah. It was more yeah. suffering. Nothing specific, but I think maybe this idea of being part of a society that you don't feel connected to anymore. You'll notice that she and Owen have that fight the, yeah. the night before she goes to get them. He says, I'm just tired of fighting for over land I don't care about. I just want to go. And I think that's the moment that Abby realizes she wants the same thing. Once she realizes that I am now not a part of the Washington Liberation Front or whatever, now she has to fill this void that was left by killing Joel and no longer feeling like you belong to the society that you've adopted. Remember, she was a firefly first and then she joins this military. All of a sudden, there's just kind of nothing left. Every, your life is now a blank slate. You don't have anything mm. to prepare for anymore. What comes rushing in is this compassion that she feels for these two lost people who have likewise lost their connection to their society. That's great. I mean, I keep yeah. going back to the phrase, last of us. It's a, such a simple collection of four words. Think of what that says. Like us, first of all, how do you define us? It changes throughout the mm -hmm. game. Right. But being the last of us, that means there's no more us. Phrase in and of itself breaks itself down logically. I think for Abby, she starts off where us was her and her father, and then the fireflies. And then when her father was ripped out of that void... Her whole life is now built on finding out where's the other us. And same with Joel, by the way. Yeah. Same with Ellie. Yeah. It's the same struggle all these characters are going through. And what's Ellie's greatest fear is being alone. Right. From the first game, she's asked by Sam, what are you afraid of? And she says, being alone, I guess. You know, she, she doesn't even think in terms of being afraid. But then when she really thinks about it, it's not having anyone. The tragedy, of course, is that arguably at the very end, she's living in her own hell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, although there is another interpretation to the very last scene, kind of jumping back to Ellie a little bit, you know, when she walks up to the house, she's wearing the friendship bracelet that Dina gave her. When she goes to California, she's not wearing that bracelet. When she gets back, you know, the, the implication just by the fade out, you know, and fade in is that she went straight there from California, but she seems to be healed up. She doesn't have her weapons with her. She also doesn't seem to be surprised that there's nothing in the house except for her stuff. So the, the idea might be that she might have gone back to Jackson. So what makes sense is that Dina went back to Jackson. Maybe Ellie went back, found her, and they have come to some sort of an understanding, if not forgiveness. Then Ellie's just going back to get her stuff and then decides against it. I mean, that's one way to interpret that. But that's, you know, that's what the, the lovely thing about that is that we'll never know. But there is a lot kind of writing on some of those details. When you first see her coming back, she seems to be refreshed, rested. And her hand is healed and she has that bracelet back on. So she, you know, something has compelled her. Her connection to Dina is not lost. That's a good point. I, you know, I thought the opposite. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I thought she went straight there and she discovered all this and she sees that her stuff's in her room and, I, yeah. you know, and she is alone. I never saw it the other way, which is interesting take mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. that. I mean, I, I like that more than the way I thought of it, but. That ambiguity, it's all the stuff we love about Lynch, too. This feeling that there's multiple ways to interpret it and we're not being spoon-fed anything, you know. It gives you the window to paint it with your own emotional comfort. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you're comfortable with, that's going to give you closure, give you some level of satisfaction. Do we have anything else in the Abbey world? There's the cliffhanger where she somehow makes it to the uh, theater. And I love how simple the explanation for that is, is that Ellie in her panic left the map there at the aquarium. She gets to the theater. So when we finally go through the whole Abby story, so we finally kind of know Abby's context for everything and we get back there. And now we're stuck in this situation where we have to be Abby and fight Ellie. I hated this. Yes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I was like, are we going to go back to Ellie now? Like, are we going to transition because I'm not prepared mentally for this? It was chilling because I'm hearing Ellie calling my character out, threatening my character that I'm playing Abby now. And I hated it. I mm -hmm. did not want to be on the end of that. Hated every moment of this mm -hmm. fight. Like I said, I'm preparing myself that Ellie is going to die. And mm -hmm. I potentially, as Abby, will kill her. And I did not want that. I thought this was the end of the game, which threw me for yeah, a loop. I did too. Yeah. I said to my wife, I'm like, hey, I'm at the end of the game. I'll, I'll be an hour. I'm going to play. This is going to be the big ending. Nope, not the big ending. It, it sucked royally. I died on purpose uh, mm -hmm. a couple times because I just didn't want to fight Ellie. She's I, I a badass. Yeah. She is. <laughs> it, it played out nicely, but I didn't like it. 
my favorite moment in that fight is there's this point where Ellie like kind of zigs around and she goes under a table and comes out the other side and she fakes you out. So she goes around one corner and then kind of turns around and goes back. And so you go around the corner that you think that she did and there's one of those mines on the ground. <laughs> Yep. All this stuff that you've been doing is now part of this boss fight. You've been so comfortable being on the giving end of that that you're now receiving it. And then, of course, there's this moment where Abby is choking Ellie. You're jamming the square button. There was a moment of like dysphoria or something where I didn't know who I was. I'd been Abby up until that point, but at the moment I was just pushing it. We're like, my eye just naturally drifted over to Ellie trying to pull Abby's hands off of her throat. I was just like, oh my God, what am I doing? Like, which, which, what am, what's happening? I guess I got to keep pushing the button. And then, of course, this just rapid fire situation where she's punching Ellie. And then Dina comes up, attacks Abby, and then Lev shoots Dina with an arrow. And then Abby has the knife to Dina's throat after she bashes her face into the floor several times. And then Ellie says she's pregnant. And then Abby says, good. And at that moment, you're kind of like, oh, right. This is who I'm being. And I've been liking Abby up until this point. And then Lev just says Abby's name. And then there's just this de-escalation and she lets her go. There's, it gives the mercy. Stop. 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 She had nothing to do with it. She's pregnant. Good. Abby. Don't ever let me see you again. And I was waiting for the title. I was waiting for the credits right there. Two things real quickly. I had a flashback with Lev and Abby, with Joel and Ellie. Ellie was that version to mm -hmm. Joel that yep. bring balance to him. And I saw that with these two. I was like, oh my God, she's bringing balance to her she didn't have. No restraint. She was just on revenge. But with Lev there... You're reining it in a little bit. You have something to live for now. To go back to what you said, Josh, at the same point, I thought we were going to go to credits. I thought they were going to give us a cliffhanger of some sort or that'd be it. Going into the next scene, we're on the farm. And a part of me was just like, this is a dream. I was mm -hmm. expecting like th the next scene is just, we're not really where we think we are. Right. I loved that whole thing where you get the normal life back for Ellie. You know, this this thing that she wants. That whole thing was just beautiful. The baby was cute. And I'm not normally into babies, but that was a cute baby. <laughs> the sheep, like yeah, herding the sheep. the sheep, the whole thing. Then, of course, the extremely realistic scene, because I don't have PTSD, but the, the moment where she knocks the shovel over and it brings back a moment of impact of the club on Joel's head. Yeah. yeah. And just waking up in this panic. She found this perfect partner in Dina. Ellie's there like screaming in the baby's face, like completely out of it. And then Dina's just like gets the baby and de-escalates Ellie. And they just kind of sit there a moment. And it's like, it's okay. It's, it's kind of nice to have a moment of excitement. Everything's been really slow lately, you know. And then the arrival of Tommy. God, that was heartbreaking. Ooh. He's all jacked. He's all jacked up. His head is... <laughs> He's like, I thought he was dead. I thought me too, Tommy, yeah. They <laughs> yeah. really like let some of these characters live on. I, I'm like, how the hell did Tommy survive that? Yeah, shot in the back of the head, yeah, and his face is all slack. Like, he had a lot of nerve damage from it, but he survived, yeah. He's running on revenge. That's yeah. the only yeah. thing that's keeping that <laughs> he, guy alive. He, mm -hmm. You know, obviously he's suffering the same thing Ellie's going through. The revenge is there. The fact that he plants that seed in Ellie, and you hear him say as he's being kicked out by Dina, you know, you said, I want revenge. You promised. I thought it was so unfair that he would do that because mm -hmm. Ellie's trying to live a normal life. For him to come in and plant that seed of revenge and then it consumes Ellie again because mm -hmm. of his action, I thought it was very selfish and it was not Tommy-like. We've seen Tommy when he was younger and he was a much different person. But because of his brother's death, he's going down this path as well like yeah. Ellie. We don't see it, but we feel it. I felt it from that mm -hmm. one little scene. You just know it all from his acting, everything. It pissed me off. You want to be like Dina, get the hell out of here. What are you yeah. doing? You're creating more chaos. Yep. I love you, Tommy, but get on your horse and get out of here. Right. <laughs> yeah. But it shows revenge is a disease. It destroys your whole life. I got something to show you. So I've been putting out feelers for months now. And this new guy heard my story. 
He told me about a woman that he traded with while he was moving through California. Described her as built like an ox, traveling with a kid with scars across his face. He said they're living along this coast in a beach sailboat right here. That's got to be her. We're done with that, Sarah. It's easy. Forget about her. You sitting all comfy way out here? Hey. I'll make her pay. Tommy. That's what you said when we got back to Jackson. Tommy. <sighs> what a joke. Can you take him, please? Yeah. Was that? Nothing. God damn it, Tommy. You know what we've been through. I'll save you. She made me a promise. I don't fucking care. The tragic thing with Ellie. It's not just Tommy, it's also the fact that she has PTSD and she can't let it go because there's something broken in her stress response now. The idea that finishing this will take that away. That's not how trauma works, you know, and, but she doesn't know that. Yeah, it's interesting when you compare the two story arcs, both involve revenge, but if I had to reach out into some other pop culture, I would say that Abby's revenge arc is more like The Crow. So you're getting revenge for, you know, someone who's died, whereas Ellie's ends up being like the unforgiven. Mm -hmm. She is just hell bent on getting revenge on the living for a crime that's already committed and in the process gives up all of her humanity. And it is, like I said, it's not even about Abby. It's about her own lack of closure. You know, when we finally get that scene with her and Joel on the porch, what we're seeing is the beginning of something that was never allowed to be. And so that's the thing that haunts and consumes her more than any hatred for Abby. Okay, so let's talk about Santa Barbara. We see Santa Barbara. That's surprised the hell out of me. Like I said, I thought the game was basically over. We go to Santa Barbara. Abby and Lev, they find that house they were told about where they, they could call the fireflies. Abby's searching for the same thing Ellie is, which is to be part of something and, and to have a life. And then is taken into slavery and, oh God, the, the pillars. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, the Yeah. Lev and Abby are basically crucified and left to die. Ellie comes up and cuts Abby down. And you think, oh, there's, there's just going to be one of those situations where it's like, wow, she's obviously already broken. There's nothing I can do, you know. Yeah, that was an interesting yeah. gameplay moment. I was actually really frustrated in that moment because yeah. I kept trying to climb up on that little bank and it made me slide down. I'm like, what yeah. is going on? I've looked yeah. at everybody around here. There's yeah. nobody here. Did you guys see, like, when you looked up, when you were Ellie, I saw someone who looked like Abby, old Abby. Right. And I'm like, oh, that's her. There's a pigtail. And I'm right. like, that's Abby. Then you realize it's behind you and it's this initiated person. My brain was like, wait, yeah. how long has it been? Her head shaved and it threw me for a loop. She tried to escape her and Lev and the people they escaped, they hang up and they just let die. Now that was the rattlers, this right. group of people that would enslave people. They were sick in their own right. And you mm -hmm. meet a couple of them. I love the mechanic they put in place. Ellie can come in there, even though she's really skinny, she can be really stealthy and she could kick some ass, we hope. But she's been the shit kicked out of her. If she were to do this, is that believable? I don't know. But I love the fact that you have to get yourself out of a situation. You get yourself hung up, upside down. You get out of it, but you get punctured by this tree part. That allows her character to be very weak and barely make it. Like, you weren't finding any mm -mm. things to heal yourself. Once you were out, you were out. When I got to that 
part where the game takes over to the shore, my life was so low. And, mm. and it was a great mechanic because it made the stakes a little bit higher. You felt more urgency. You didn't feel like a one right. woman in the army at that right. point. Especially after several hours of playing as Abby. Incendiary shotguns and shit. You know. And you can um, you can release the chains of the clickers, and mm -hmm. they will attack, or people yeah. that were chained up, and they will attack. Yeah. And I love um, th there's a bunch of people that are captive, and you free them, and you're kind of like, here's a redeeming moment for Ellie. You're a hero in some weird way right now. These people are going to remember you that you just freed them. You're on a revenge mission. You just save lives, which I thought was kind of cool, a redeeming moment mm -hmm. that I don't know if they were to make a part three, would that be talked about, about the woman who came through and saved these people? Right. We, now, we hear in the background, they have a firefight. We don't know who survived, which I liked, but you mm -hmm. can hear the firefight happening, uh, going, oh my God, they're free, and then all hell breaks loose. Yeah, all the all state goes up in flames, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> which was really cool. When she's about to get on her boat and she has the flashback of Joel, I was like, God damn it, no. Just get on your <laughs> yeah. boat and go. I was like, there's no way. You two are so weak right now. I don't yeah. want to do I didn't want to. Emotionally, no. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. I was like, I'm yeah. done. No more. Yeah. yeah. It was awful. It, and then putting that knife to Lev's throat to force Abby to do it. You know, it's like this this most pathetic fight. Everybody's just weak. Oh God, when the, the knife slowly enters Abby's chest and that whole thing, you know, it's just, ah, uh, you know. <laughs> but Oof. I find it interesting that the thing that makes Ellie finally stop is a flash of Joel on the porch right before their final conversation and she lets her go, you know. That's that last little bit of humanity left that Ellie hasn't lost. You know, and it might be enough to grow back later, but we may never see that, you know. That's essentially why Joel ended up doing what he did with Ellie, because he felt right. that attachment, thought of his own daughter, you know, in, in the flashback scene. I believe that happens in, in part one as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for Abby, the flashback happens when she sees the two hanging bodies and that causes her to act out of compassion for two other people. And then, you know, for Ellie to see that, within the context of this moment of rage and total betrayal or um, for revenge, I think it was really telling that, you know, that one spark, that one act of compassion really is a seed upon which you can build a moral life despite all that has gone on before. It's like uh, that little seed at the end of the never ending story. It's like, it's one, mm -hmm. it's one thing and you can build yeah. a whole world on top of that. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I just have like, the random thoughts about what I thought the ending was. You know what? The first movie that popped into my head is The Hurt Locker for some reason, because The Hurt Locker, you know, his character didn't know normalcy only when he was out in that world of war. Mm. And I thought of Ellie in a weird way because she was trying to be normal, but the moment someone sucked her back in, she seemed more comfortable. Like she feels at home holding a shotgun to that rattler's head. This is the world she was young enough that that's all she knows. So normalcy is not in the cards for her, obviously. So I thought of the Hurt Locker just because of the ending where he couldn't stay at home. He didn't want to be with his wife. He wanted to be out there. And that was the whole point for her. Just leaving everything, just see her walk away. I'm like, what is she going to do? Is she going to blow off steam and just go kill clickers? She doesn't have anything with her. Is she going to go back to Jackson? Is she just going to be like, I'm on my own now and made my peace? I'm like, I don't know, win back Dina? But then like, Jubal, you bring back, did it happen the opposite way? Yeah. Did she already make peace with Dina? Or did Dina allow her to come back home? Is she there to get her stuff? I kind of like what you said, Jubal, because mm. to me, it makes more sense. Um, mm. And I haven't watched or read anything about it because I wanted to wait to do this podcast. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's new to me. And I, I like that theory. I do too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it sits emotionally well with me, mm -hmm. but my fear yeah. is that all we've seen on the screen is she's alone, has nothing and nobody. It feels like justice in some ways. It's just a terrible yeah. justice. Yeah. You know, the first thing that we see and the last thing that we see is the guitar you know, in this game. Uh, that is, of course, the connection that she has with Joel. But the other connection that she has with Joel is killing people, <laughs> is violence. Yeah. I mean, you know, she has a conversation with Dina, but I can't remember how it went, but they have this conversation early in Seattle where they say, when was the first time you killed a human? And I can't remember what Ellie says, if the first time that she kills somebody is when she's with Joel or not. But 
Yeah, yeah. I think I remember that being an emotional touch point in the first. Yeah. So in some screwed up kind of way, her ability to murder is part of her connection to Joel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like her, it's, it's in her DNA right now. And Joel, mm -hmm. maybe losing those fingers and not being able to play guitar now, maybe trying to play again was just saying goodbye to her past. And maybe she just realized, I got to move on. Like, this mm -hmm. is going to kill me inside. But she doesn't have anyone. For Dina to deal with a newborn and with a partner with PTSD who doesn't mm -hmm. know how to handle that, that's mm -hmm. a tall order. Ellie's a tall order for anyone at this mm -hmm. point. Although going back to Jackson, you still have a community. I imagine someone there is a designated therapist. If you're trying to build a society and you don't have a therapist, that's definitely something you need. Right, um, right. To have people to talk to, you know. I thought what was interesting to go back to the very beginning where we're shown Jackson is, an, is like a thriving old West town with electricity. I love that town, yeah. Yeah, just that little story moment with Seth, you know, the bartender. And oh yeah, and then you finally do get to see how that night went down. You know, yes, and yes. One thing that Druckmann said is that they actually had almost completed, they had it at about 80%, a level early, which was to show that they, that Jackson, they have like a festival, like a carnival. So there would have been a lot of like little things to go on and like throw the ball into the cup and all that kind of stuff. They, they had it already almost made and then they realized this is going to throw the pacing off. So they cut it and they say they don't have plans for DLC for this one, which is kind of a shame because there's definitely some interesting things they could do. But well, we got the snowball fight. That was, that was cool. Fun. Yeah. yeah. Also, I don't know if you noticed, but you know, when they do the splash screen after the game ends, you now have the daytime shot of the boat on the shore. And that oh, is I didn't Cat see that. Now. That's Catalina Island, which tells us that Lev and Abby made it. Oh, OK. They say it's a domed. You're going to go up on the shore and you'll see a domed building. That's yes. where you need to go. And it shows us a domed building. So they give us confirmation that Abby and Lev made it. But it's just so subtle. Yeah. Great that, catch. That's great. Yeah, that's <laughs> so cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, this makes me want to play it again on New Game mm -hmm. Plus. Honestly, just getting prepped for this show, I'm, I think I'm going to jump back in and play it again. We yeah. get to play it with all the stuff we've gotten, right? Yeah. Which is new. I don't think the first one let you do that. No, and there's also some more customizable difficulty levels, which I kind of wish they had at the first, you know, which was the fact that you can make enemies smarter or tougher. You can make yourself have less health or you can make Dina or Jesse, whoever's along with you, more passive or aggressive. Oh. So what I did is I turned up all the difficulty on everybody, but I made D I made the companion more aggressive and I put resources to crank those up so I can get lots of resources, but then I made everything else super hard. And that's a blast. That's a blast. Yeah, yeah. I think I might do that. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And the slow down time thing. I didn't know yeah. about that. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about something. It's interesting. I I when I'm really excited for something, I kind of ignore trailers. I ignore anything mm -hmm. they give me. I watch the E3 thing. But it's interesting how the two trailers, or whatever you want to call them, was Abby being hung up, very violent, out mm -hmm. of context. There was speculation, is that Ellie's mom? That was a big rumor online. And I watched that, and I said, that's all I need to see. Because I don't know what the hell I just saw. Holy crap, it was violent. I was amazed they used that as the first thing. Because <laughs> I was waiting for that scene, and it happened so late in the game. And then the fact that they gave us three E3s ago when Sony was there, they gave us almost the ending. It wasn't the ending, but that scene was shown to us at the end at the dance. Yeah. And, you know, they made the whole theater look like the inside the barn. And it was so beautiful. They took those two scenes out of context. It just kind of showed the graphics and what they're capable of doing. But it's interesting how they picked two things that happened way late in the game. And then I'm like, I don't need to see you anymore. I'm done. I just want to play the game with no spoilers. There was a red herring that they built that was just its own little standalone thing where it shows Ellie sitting and playing guitar in, in like a bedroom in some random house. There's a bunch of dead people on the floor. And Joel walks in and says, you're really going to do this, Ellie? You know, and she says, I'm going to find that I'm going to kill every last one of them. And so and that that's was the one I saw. Yeah. And that was obviously to throw us off the scent or any uh, expectation of how they actually did it. So that was it was essentially a lie, but it was a white lie, you know. <laughs> yeah. I loved that they did that. It might piss people off, but for me, I'm like, no, do that because mm -hmm. I, I don't don't yes. ruin it. Right. Yeah. Well, it yeah. underscores this is an emotional game. This is yeah. this is far more of an emotional game than it is a button smasher. Of course, when there were leaks, I just basically stayed off of YouTube as much as possible, and I just didn't want to look at anything. But I know that what was leaked was that Joel dies, 
you play as his killer for half the game, which was true. But what isn't true is that the person that kills Joel is a trans woman. The idea that because Abby's buff or whatever, that it's obviously a dude. The people were mad because they thought they made a trans person the, the enemy. That a trans person kills Joel and then goes against a Christian sect that's homophobic. <laughs> This is why I avoid spoilers, because yeah. that's... Uh, I mean, so they basically made it into, oh, this is going to be SJW propaganda, blah, blah, oh, blah, you know, and... Uh, that and, explains it. Yeah, and so that's why everyone was angry, and it's just like, oh, my God. You'd be well, I did see that Metacritic has changed the way that it accepts reviews now because oh, of this game. It got review bombed by people who no way could have completed it. Just because I love the arts, it just bothers me that these people put their heart and soul into something and mm -hmm. if you disagree with it or you don't like it, that's totally fine. It's subjective. But yep. to review bomb something like that, it, to me, it's just, why? What do you get out of it? You want to ask the person, did that really make you feel any better? Because yeah. you're mm -hmm. only hurting yourself. I mean, the game did four... Four million units, I think, or something like that very the quickly. The first weekend. Yeah. Yeah. It beat out Spider-Man, which was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I didn't think that was going to happen. But... Mm -hmm. I liked like IGN didn't get into it, but there's some reviewers that I will watch on YouTube I stayed away from because they did. I'm like, don't cover leaks. You're giving them a pat on the back. It just sucks that we were in a pandemic that the game had to be pushed. And the fact that they had to work from home, I think was probably the reason yeah. someone got hold of an old build because mm -hmm. we're more vulnerable working from home. To have someone tweet out a leak and ruin it it's infuriating and it bothers me. I, I don't mm -hmm. think anybody's work should be leaked like that. I just no. think it's pretty then what happens is that it escalated since release where Laura Bailey, who plays Abby, has gotten death threats and somebody actually saying, I'm going to hunt you down and kill your child. I know. Um, it's crazy. And that's but, just, I mean, I mean, it's literally crazy. That's like a derangement. One thing, too, is that some people did get part of the leak where they knew that Joel was going to die, but then it was almost a relief to those people when he died early because they were like, oh, now everything's fresh and new again because, like, what was leaked happened. But some people took those things and then made it into this whole weird, sick thing. This, this, this well, idea in lesser hands, that would have been the ending. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's just vile, and I, I'm hoping that it kind of trails off and they find something else to be pissed off about. But Well, I think, yeah. you know, the quality of this game is going to win out. Let's call it the firewalk with me effect. People are going through emotional grief in response to this art that mm -hmm. they invested, obviously, a lot of emotion in. And right. when it doesn't go the way you think it's going to go, you throw a tantrum. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't throw a tantrum for 10 years. And in 10 years, people will look back on this game and say, it's a masterpiece. It was built by design to piss us off to a certain point. This idea that, wait, what? I'm Abby? And then within a half hour, 45 minutes, a sane person maybe starts to... <laughs> Think about, okay, why did they do this and things like that? And then you just get invested in the story again and you get swept away and then it's all the better for it. Let me ask you guys this. If Last of Us 3 comes out five years from now and Ellie is not even in the game and it's all from Abby's point of view, do you think they could pull that off? Absolutely. I, I, I do too. I, mm -hmm. I, and I feel like if we got a part three, which Neil Druckmann said he's always wanted to do a trilogy, and it sounds like this could be it, I would see us continuing the Abby storyline and the Ellie storyline. I think it would be in tandem. And will they meet up again? What if we started off the whole game with, was Abby, and then Ellie showed up later on? I mean, that could be a situation too, but I think people would still buy it. People would be very excited. And I think the backlash will be forgotten over time. Mm -hmm. um, and then when part three were to come out, I think people will forget about all the crap and just think about how emotional the game was and how excited they are for the new one. But yeah, I mean, I, I would love to continue Abby and Lev's storyline, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the obvious thing, I think, and of course they're not going to go the obvious route, but the obvious thing would be that Ellie's purpose in life now is to track down the Fireflies and offer herself to them for an order for a cure to be made. And then, of course, Abby is part of the Fireflies now again. So, you know, that would be like the obvious thing. But, you know. So she would have to protect Ellie on their way to the facility yeah. in Utah to make that happen. I yeah. think that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> so is there going to be an HBO show for this? Did I see that? Yes. yes. That's oh, what I'm really worried about this. Ah, no. No, yeah. no. Well, don't be well, worried. Well, Druckmann is, is part of the team. Oh, yes. okay. Druckmann's part of the team, and it's from the same people who did Chernobyl. 
So I oh, kind of feel like you're yeah. in good hands. Yeah. I feel okay. like you're in good hands. There's been talks, years and years of talks about a movie. It's always fallen through. And you know, Druckmann in the beginning was just like, I want to be involved, but I don't have time to worry about a movie when I'm doing a game. It sounds like Neil Druckmann is involved and the uh, same producers of Chernobyl. And I feel like they could do it justice. But oh, I also feel sure. like you would have to change it up a little bit because so many people have played the game. Mm-hmm. You want to make it fresh for the the gamers but you want to make it different enough for them but just brand new for people who don't know anything about it mm-hmm. so that's a tall task right there how mm-hmm. the hell yeah. do you do that it's, right? it's almost game of thrones ish task right like, uh, how do you take those novels and turn them into a show well and now we're here. how do you finish the novels and now we've had what 10 years of the walking dead so they'd have to differentiate themselves from that and uh, and the way that last of us does is that i think it's a much deeper story so then you're like, okay, so do we just rehash the story of Ellie and Joel, but with like Hugh Jackman or something? Or <laughs> or do we set another story in this world? And then how do we keep it from being like The Walking Dead? So that's the challenge I think they have is, you know, do we want familiar characters or a whole new thing? You know? I would want Joel and Ellie's story brought to the screen because that first game can be played out in chunks. Like when you play, you kind of feel like you're playing this HBO. Yeah. Show. I mean, when they meet up with Tommy and his whole thing, that, that's a whole episode right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, totally. Learning about Tommy, the family of Joel, learning about all these new people, this new settlement. The first game you know. separated by season, right? Yes. Spring, yeah. so that, that could easily be extracted into months where well, you have 12 episodes, one for each month, and it follows that same course. It's, it's all there. I think so too, but a part of me feels like after playing part two, in a perfect world, I'm excited for the HBO, I'm not saying that, but in a perfect world, I would just love these to stand on its own as a game, and mm-hmm. that's it. I get it. I get why. It would expose us to new people, and I think that's an awesome thing. Mm-hmm. But in my own perfect world, I feel like these things stand on their own, and it Absolutely. shows what gaming can do Absolutely. when it comes to storytelling. Yeah. So yeah. one of the first thoughts I had when I finished it is I wish that Mark Frost could play this game. Because if you could get an inkling of the power of a video game to pull someone in context, let's bring Twin Peaks back this way. All those actors are dead, but we can still bring their characters back in a unique way that can let people play through and become part and build their own story out. I bet Lynch could, you know, if you could kind of show him around the process, because he's actually a tech head in a lot of ways. He says the reason why he does commercials is just so he can play with the new gear. Like yeah. he, you can do this stuff in COVID. Yeah. And this is going to affect the arts and entertainment industry for years to come. It'll be five years before we're making films, if we ever get there again, mm-hmm. the way that we were on the, vo- in the at the volume that we could have in television shows, too video games i mean bungie's proven it with destiny yeah it takes yeah. longer we're mm-hmm. having to restructure a lot of the ways that we work together and the processes we use but from a remote perspective video games and novels i believe are going to be the two primary ways that people ingest their dramatic narratives over the next few years right and lynch always talks about he likes having room to dream and what better than to, than to do all your mocap in a basically empty room that you fill with your own imagination and then spend all of the time building things around it i love I mean, this Let's yeah. make this happen. Yeah, let's make it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, The Lion King, the whole thing was directed in a VR headset. He said he put on a headset and he literally was in the world and he directed it in a headset. The whole thing was done virtually, he said. I know people wow. complain it's a carbon copy of the cartoon. I never saw it. I'm not interested. It's not my thing. But how they made it. That's John cool. Favreau said he put a helmet on and he virtually directed this thing. It's crazy. Mm. And that CG was pretty amazing. But yeah, I mean, I just love that games, we've taken a long time to come to this point, And I think this generation has proved that games can tell a thought-provoking story, can evoke emotion, can do all the things other mediums can do. We've known this. It's just taking the rest of the world to come to the table and figure that out for themselves. People who've gamed all their life were growing up with this. I think people never took it seriously as, oh, it's a kid thing. But no, it could be an any age thing. What do you think, think the first game was that made you feel that? This generation, especially. I think Last of Us 1 did. Mm-hmm. I, I think mm-hmm. it hit me. I haven't played Bioshock. And that's a game in my backlog I want to play. And I know that yeah. was yeah. Uh, very... Bioshock for me, probably, yeah. Metal Gears and the Final Fantasies, they, they all had it there. Zelda had it there. You know, they, yeah. It was there in earlier games. But I fit, you're, to your point, it's an evolution and the ability yeah. to tell a, a more richly 
an emotional story within the context of the technology has just grown up with us. Right. Yeah. And I think it's the CG too, because I think you're closer to reality where people can take it seriously. An outsider would be like, wow, that, that looks really good. It sounds really good. And wow, they're actually having real dialogue, not cheesy one-liners. So yep. yeah. Uh, before we go, I just want to ask, what was your initial reaction when you see her walking away? Like, did you feel relieved? Did you feel confused? Did you feel like ah, I need more here? Because I felt like pent up. I felt mm. aggravated. I, I love the game, but I just felt like there's no release. I didn't right. feel complete. I felt that way too. But as a Twin Peaks fan, I felt that was the feeling I was supposed to totally. have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, totally. It, it felt just like that moment. It was yeah. like, okay, mm -hmm. you know what? Yeah. They probably deserve it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In some way, this is justice, and I'm going to let yeah. it sit there. The interpretation with that she'd already been to Jackson is one that's out there, and I didn't necessarily believe it, but that's what I'd like to believe. I had this feeling that where she was going was back to Jackson to sort of eat a little crow. I had a feeling that Dina would ultimately take her back because we didn't talk much about Dina, but she seems like a real sweet person. It would have worked out. I did feel that the revenge is gone felt like that had dissipated from driving her actions mm. and, and from taking over her life. So I guess hopeful in some ways that by setting that aside, she can now actually build a life. I'm going 
going there no more to roam I'm just a going over Jordan I'm just a going over home I'm just a Still